Uh, our next speaker, um, I would say loves Skepticon so much that she, uh, she actually Skyped in last year because she couldn't make it in person. And the feeling is totally mutual. <laughs> Everybody, Greta Christina. Thank you. Thank you. I am so happy to be here, actually, in person. Uh, you have no idea. I had to Skype in last year because I was recovering from surgery, and that I was happy to be able to Skype in, but it's so much better to be here, actually, in person. Um, hi, I'm Greta Christina, and today I am talking about activism burnout, prevention and treatment. By the way, this is not technical failure. I just don't use PowerPoint, um, except, well, you'll see. Don't worry, Rob, it's all right. Um, so I'm talking today about the prevention and treatment of activist burnout. Um, wait, hang on, there we go. Um, a whole lot of people in the atheist movement are enormously excited about the future of this movement. You know, we see the numbers going up and we are so excited and so happy. We see so much potential for this movement to grow and to keep growing and to just radically change the world for the better. We're especially excited about how many students and other young people are in this movement. You know, students and young people are the future of this movement. That's kind of a cliche, and I think it's actually kind of a patronizing cliche, because as Liz Liddell of the Secular Student Alliance points out, students are the future of this movement, but you're also the present of this movement. You know, students and young people are doing a huge amount of the on-the-ground community building that everybody in this movement thinks is so important. And everybody in the atheist movement, and certainly organizers and thought leaders in the atheist movement, we want every person in the atheist movement, young people, students, old people, middle-aged, whatever, we want all of you to stay in the movement for years to come. We want every single person in this room and everybody and all the groups that you're all representing to stay in this movement for a long time. I mean, think about this. If every single atheist activist stayed involved in the movement, even in some small way, think about what the world would look like in just a few years. If every single student in an atheist student group stayed involved in atheism after they graduated, um, if everybody who's in a local atheist group found a new a local atheist group or started a new local atheist group when they moved, think about how radically the change the world would be. I mean, that involvement can take lots of different forms, but whatever form your activism takes, we want you in it for the long haul. We do not want you to burn out. So, how are we gonna make that happen? Uh, first, I wanna talk a little bit about what we mean by burnout and what the signs are. I mean, it's not like burnout is a medical diagnosis that you can look up in the medical manuals. Um, it's not, it's a colloquial term. There's not a very specific agreed upon definition. Um, I pieced this together uh, mostly from the websites of the Mayo Clinic and the National Institute of Health and a couple of other sites. Burnout is a state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. Uh, signs of it can include feeling drained and overloaded, uh, feeling a lack of energy or creativity about your activism. I mean, this applies to work and other things, but I'm talking about activism today. Um, uh, feeling alienated or detached from your activism, uh, feeling cynical, disillusioned, or hopeless about it, uh, not getting satisfaction from it, feeling like it's taking over your life, uh, feeling increasingly negative or frustrated with it, uh, feeling like you have to force yourself to do it, um, a loss of pleasure in activities you once found enjoyable, both within activism and outside of it, um, being irritable, impatient, or short-tempered with people you're doing activism with, uh, difficulty focusing, difficulty making decisions, changes in sleep or appetite, unexplained headaches, backaches, or other physical complaints, and using food, drugs, or alcohol to feel better or simply not to feel. Does any of that sound familiar to anybody here? Yeah, me too. Um, now, very importantly, these can all be symptoms of other conditions as well, including serious mental health problems. And if you are experiencing some or many of them to a troubling degree, it is probably a good idea to talk with your medical provider. This talk is not, repeat, not, uh, medical advice on a medical condition. It's reasonably well-researched colloquial advice on a fairly common condition of life. And it's a condition of life that sucks. It sucks for you, and it sucks for the people around you, and it sucks for the movement. So, 
How are we going to prevent it? How are we going to intervene when it starts to happen? How are we going to keep you all in the movement for the long haul? Okay, so there's one big message that I have here. This is the message that I want all of you to remember if you don't remember anything else about my talk today. I mean, pretty much this entire talk is about 50 minutes of me restating this message again and again and yammering on about the finer points. Um, and in fact, I don't normally use PowerPoint when I speak, uh, but for this talk, I have created an analog PowerPoint slide because I want to make sure this point really gets across. This is what I want you all to remember if you don't remember anything else. Self-care is not selfish. Self-care is not selfish. Um, so, so here's an analogy. Uh, think about a fruit tree. If a fruit tree doesn't get water, sunlight, and fertilizer, it's going to stop bearing fruit. Um, or think about a car. If a car doesn't get gas, oil, maintenance, and repairs, um, it's going to stop moving forward. Um, if you want to keep bearing fruit, if you want to keep moving forward, you need to replenish yourself. You need to give yourself fuel. You need to give yourself sunlight. You need to take care of yourself. Uh, the first and foremost form that that takes is take care of your physical health and your mental health. I mean, you all, you're atheists, you're skeptics, you're materialists, you presumably understand that you do not have a soul separate from your body. You presumably understand that you are your body. So taking care of yourself means taking care of your body. Um, and that includes the part of your body that is your brain. Uh, get regular exercise, eat a healthy diet, manage your stress, and get enough sleep. And I know, I sound like your grandmother, I sound like a boring presentation in sixth grade health class, you know, eat your vegetables and don't stay up so late. Um, trust me on this, taking care of your health is not boring or stodgy. Taking care of your health is a radical act of empowerment. It is especially a radical act of empowerment in a world that dismisses and demonizes atheists. Every time you take care of yourself, you are defying the people who say that atheists are second class and that we don't deserve care. Taking care of yourself is a radical act of empowerment and it is radical long-term activist strategy. You are one of the people who matters. You are going to change the world. And you are going to be much more effective at that if you are powerful and strong. Creating a world full of motivated, energetic, resilient, atheist activists, that is freaking well not boring. Now, it is okay, of course, if you push yourself in somewhat unhealthy ways for short bursts. I mean, if it's the week before the big conference you're organizing, you know, of course you're going to stress out and eat pizza for every meal and get four hours of sleep, you know, every night. I'm not going to try to talk you out of that. It would be a waste of time if I did. Also, I'd be a giant hypocrite if I tried to talk you out of that, given what my own life looks like when I'm finishing up a book. Um, but that should be the exception. That should not be how you live your life all the time. Uh, and in fact, getting rest and exercising and eating well and so on in your everyday life, that's what will give you the energy to get through the stressful, ridiculous weeks of eating pizza and getting four hours of sleep a night. Um, and if you're ever tempted to live your life like that all the time because there's just so much to be done and so few people to do it and not enough hours to do it in, I want you to remember the burnout mantra. In fact, I want to do something really dorky. Can we all say this together? Self-care is not selfish. Um, also, um, keep an eye on your drug use. Uh, that, and drugs includes alcohol, and drugs includes caffeine. Um, I'm not going to say drugs are bad, OK? I mean, I promise this is not sixth grade health class. Um, you know, drugs can be fun. I have enjoyed them on myself on many occasions, many, many occasions. Um, but. <laughs> Drug abuse is a real thing, and it can especially be a real thing when people consistently use drugs or alcohol or other drugs to self-medicate for stress. Um, so just keep an eye on that. If you think you might be going down that road, uh, dial it back a notch. Dial back both on the alcohol and drug use and also on whatever's stressing you out. Um, 
And if you're really going down that road, if you or other people in your life are getting worried about your alcohol or drug use, if it's interfering with your ability to function, uh, consider getting some help with it. Uh, and very importantly, speaking of getting help, a lot of the symptoms of burnout can also be symptoms of depression, anxiety, or other serious mental health problems, uh, some of which can also be triggered or made worse by a stress. So if you or other people in your life are worried that you might be experiencing something more serious or more debilitating than just, I'm really getting sick of atheist activism burnout, um, get some help. You know, all the wonderful self-help and self-care ideas in this talk, they are awesome. They are not a substitute for actual help from a mental health care professional. Um, and asking for help is not a sign of weakness, it is a sign of strength. Okay, so back to the wonderful self-help care and the self-help and self-care stuff that I'm here to talk about. There's a particular form of taking care of yourself and in particular taking care of your mental and emotional health that I think is hugely important for activists. And that is to carve out a life for yourself and an identity for yourself that is not about atheism. Um, I, I had a realization about this myself a little while ago. I started noticing that, you know, friends would ask me, how are you? You know, it's like I'd see a friend and they'd say, hey, I haven't seen you for a while, how are you doing? And I would say something like, oh my gosh, we just raised almost $100,000 for the Secular Student Alliance. Or I'd say, oh my gosh, there's this discussion of harassment policies at atheist conferences and it's turned into this ridiculous firestorm that's eating the internet. And I started realizing my friends did not ask me how atheism was. My friends asked me how I was. <laughs> I am not atheism. You know, atheism is hugely important to me. It's a big part of my life, but I am not atheism, and atheism is not me. So, get a life. <laughs> um, I, I know that sounds really obnoxious and snarky. When people say, get a life, it sounds really jerkish. I do not mean it that way. I mean it sincerely, with deep affection and love. A life is a good thing to have. You deserve to have a life. So get one, um, separate from atheism. You know, get a hobby, take up line dancing or playing the saxophone or something, read some books that aren't about atheism or skepticism or science or activism, uh, make some friends who aren't atheist activists and spend some time doing, you know, doing things with them. Uh, and very importantly, very, 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 very importantly, uh, take a break now and then. You know, take a long weekend, take a vacation, go camping or something. Even just turn off your computer and your phone for a day. Um, and if you're seriously starting to burn out, consider taking a longer break from activism for a little while. You know, recharge your batteries. Burnout is like just about every other problem. It's easier to deal with if you catch it early. You know, if you're starting to feel like you're seriously burning out, it is much better and we would all much rather you take a couple months off now than to just stick with it even though you're sick of it and then seriously burn out in a few years and leave the movement altogether. And I know, I know there aren't enough hours in the day, you don't have time for a vacation or a hobby, you don't have time to take a break. How can you spend all that time on yourself when there's all this work that needs to be done? And you all know what I'm gonna say, right? <laughs> Self-care is not selfish. Um, there's a specific pointer on this, um, which is to set aside time for family and friends. And when I set it, say set it aside, I mean literally set it aside. If you have to, schedule it. Um, if my wife Ingrid and I look at our calendars and we see that we have some ridiculous month coming up where one of us has something scheduled almost every weekend, we will deliberately block off the one free weekend we have and set it aside just to hang out with each other. I mean, I will literally put in my calendar for Saturday and Sunday, hang out with Ingrid and do nothing. You know, sit around the house, watch TV, let cats crawl all over us. You know, that is in my calendar for almost every month. Because um, if we, we don't block it out and put it in our calendar, we won't do it. And it's really, really important to us that we do it. So, get a life set aside time for that life, uh, find things that you like to do outside atheism, and very closely related to that, and I think very importantly, find things you like to do within atheism. There are plenty of people in this movement who will try to tell you what kind of activism you should be doing. 
there's plenty of people who will tell you that we all need to be working on visibility or community building or interfaith work or coalition building with other social change movements. You know, and to some extent, I do think it's worth debating what our priorities should be, certainly on an organizational level. It's reasonable to press the organizations who are representing us to focus on issues that matter to us. That's what their job. Their job is to represent us. It's our job to tell them what, how we want them to do that. Um, and it's worth debating what our focus should be on an organizational level. But ultimately, and especially on an individual level, the kind of activism you should be doing is the kind of activism you enjoy doing. You know, you should be doing whatever activism gets you excited and inspired. You know, it's hard enough to do activism when you are energized and motivated. It's still, even when you're totally excited, totally energized, not burned out, it's still really freaking hard. Doing activism that you've become lukewarm about that is gonna burn you out for sure. And we don't want you to burn out. We want you all to be powerful. And the most powerful form of activism is not community building. The most powerful form of activism is not visibility. It's not interfaith work. The most powerful form of activism is the activism that you enjoy doing and that you will therefore stick with. Um, and there's an important note I want to make about this, which is that as your life changes, you may find that the kind of activism that inspires you changes. And you may also find that the kind of activism that you're capable of doing changes. You know, if you move to an area where there's a strong local atheist community, you might get inspired to get involved in that community. Uh, if you move to an area where there's not a strong local atheist community, you might get inspired to do more activism on the national level or on the internet. Or you might get inspired to start a local atheist community. Um, if you get a job with a specialized skill set or knowledge set, you might get inspired to contribute that to the community. You know, if you get a job where you get knowledge about history or law, public relations and advertising, web design, graphic design, videography, how to set up a sound system. You know, you can contribute that and that may change as your life changes. If you start getting more inspired by some other social change movement, you know, if you start getting more inspired by environmentalism or poverty or drug policy than you are by atheism, Excellent. You know, I'm not going to tell you, no, you have to stay with atheism forever. Atheism has to be your top priority forever and you're bad people if you don't do that. Um, I'm not going to tell you that. Um, what I will tell you is that you might find yourself being inspired to maintain your atheist activism in the form of coalition building with these other movements and doing atheist visibility and uh, education within them. Uh, if you have kids, you may find yourself inspired to form secular parenting groups or daycare centers or doing other family-oriented community building. And frankly, if you have kids, you may find that that's all that you have time and energy for for a while. Um, if you get a high-stress, high-paying job, you may find that the way, main way you can contribute to the movement is with money. And that is not trivial. Believe me, if there's organization leaders out there, they're going, no, that's not trivial, please. That's really important. Cough it up. Um, and, and no matter what you're doing or where you are in your life, you can do the form of activism that is being an out atheist. If that is safe for you, you can be an out atheist as out as you can be, as safely as you can be. We need all of that. In this movement, there are jobs for everyone. So do whatever activism you're excited about and give yourself permission to let that change as your life changes. You know, just because you've always been the one to do volunteer coordinating for your local group, if you're getting sick of doing volunteer coordinating for your local group, you know, find someone else to do it. Train them, pass the baton, and find something else that you love to do. Once again, self-care is not selfish. Um, closely related to that is let go of perfectionism. And I know this is really hard for a lot of us. It's really hard for me. Um, but there's a saying that you may be familiar with, and this is something that's kind of my little mantra when I'm freaking out about every little detail. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Remember that. Obsessively striving to make everything perfect is going to stress you out for sure. And also speaking from unfortunate personal experience here, it makes you a horror show to be around. I am the worst person in the world to be around when I'm being perfectionist, you know. Uh, Ingrid will tell you stories of me losing my shit about Christmas is ruined because we, I forgot to make gravy, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, 
And that makes you a horror show to be around, which paradoxically, what do you know, makes things not be perfect. Um, let go of perfectionism and let go of either or thinking. A few flaws in a project does not make it a failure. Um, also really helpfully, and this is something that I've been looking at a lot lately, do one thing at a time. Uh, multitasking may seem like it's magically giving you lots of extra time. It doesn't. There's plenty of research. You can Google this. Research very consistently shows that multitasking is a myth. It doesn't happen. We really can only focus on one thing at a time. And what we think of is mu as multitasking is really just rapidly shifting our attention back and forth between lots of different things. It's not actually multitasking. And it's actually very inefficient. The mental energy that it takes to shift our attention every five minutes, you know, or five times in a minute, as you know, if you have five tabs open on your computer screen, that actually makes us less productive, not more. And it is very exhausting mentally and emotionally. It's very stressful. Uh, so as much as you can let go of multitasking, unitasking is healthier and it's a lot more efficient. Um, related to that, put down the phone now and then. <laughs> I mean, just now and then, you know, I'm not saying again, I'm not being a fuddy-duddy saying, you kids these days with your electronic devices that you're always tuned into, I mean, I have one too and I'm glued to, glued to it, but put it down now and then. You know, being wired into electronic devices every waking moment, it makes it harder to stay really present with the people and the activities in our lives. You know, if you're trying to get a life, if you're saying, Greta told me to get a life, so I'm gonna get a life, I'm gonna reduce my stress, I'm gonna take a long walk, I'm gonna have a romantic dinner with my sweetie, you're not gonna get that much benefit from it if you're checking your messages every five minutes. Um, and also, something that I have found is that being constantly wired feeds into the delusion that we're indispensable. And that delusion makes it harder to take breaks and to say no and to otherwise take care of ourselves. Um, and remember to look at the long game. You know, try not to focus too much on the roller coaster of the successes and failures of this month and this week and this day. Um, if you're feeling exhausted or discouraged, remind yourself of how far this movement has already come. How much better we're doing now than we were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. Um, and that leads me to another hugely important principle of taking care of yourself and avoiding burnout. And this is one that I have struggled with immensely. I mean, honestly, in this talk, I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to all of you. This is as much a pep talk for me as it is to you. I wrote this talk because I felt like I was burning out. I was like, hey, I bet other people are too. I should research that and find out how to avoid it and what to do about it. Um, and that is especially true with this one, you. And I am speaking personally to each one of you. Imagine that I'm not up on a stage. Imagine that we are out in the corridor. We are having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I am looking you in the eye. You are not, repeat not, single-handedly responsible for the success or failure of the atheist movement. You are not Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You are not Frodo. The entire weight of the world is not resting on your shoulders. The entire fate of the atheist movement is not resting on your shoulders. The entire fate of your atheist group isn't resting on your shoulders. And if it is, you really need to restructure your group. Um, <laughs> you know, it's okay to take a break. It is okay to be selective about what projects you get involved with. It's okay to start with smaller projects and gradually build up to more ambitious ones. It's okay to delegate. It's okay to ask for help. And believe it or not, okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. This is a wildly radical, totally extreme idea, but I think it's true, I'm gonna put it out there. When somebody asks you to do something, it is okay to say no. I know, freaky people out there going, what the hell is she saying? A totally bizarre concept, I'm gonna give you a minute to wrap your minds around it. But really, if your time and energy are stretched too thin right now, or if somebody's asking you to do something that's just not in your wheelhouse, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say, I'm sorry, my time and energy are really stretched thin right now, or that's just not in my wheelhouse, or even I just don't want to. It is okay. You don't even have to make an excuse. It is okay to say, I don't want to do that, and so I'm not going to. Um, if you can, it's nice to direct them to somebody else who has more time and energy and maybe more interest in that particular project. 
But if you can't, that job is still not your responsibility. I mean, I get that this is a bizarre concept, especially for those of us who grew up in the Midwest, but people asking you to do something does not confer moral responsibility on you to do it. There are a handful of things that confer moral responsibility on us to do things. Somebody coming to us and asking us to do them is not one of them. Um, and in fact, and this is another lesson I have had a very hard time learning, and it's one that I still sometimes struggle with, it is much better and much more helpful to say no up front than it is to say yes and then flake out or do a half-assed job because you didn't actually have the time and energy to do this thing. Um, and in fact, I want to do a show of hands here things. Um, I'm talking to organizers, and by organizers I mean anybody who has asked people to do something for organized atheism. If you've ever done that, you're an organizer. I know. It's, I, when I realized that, shit, I'm an organizer, I was like... So, there's a lot of organizers in the room. If you've ever asked somebody to do something, if you're asking somebody to take on a project and you have a choice between them saying yes and then flaking out or doing a half-assed job, or instead them saying, no, I really can't do that, I'm sorry, you should find somebody else. Okay, show of hands, who wants the person to say yes and then flake out or do a half-assed job? Anybody? I don't see any hands. Now, who wants the honest assessment of people's abilities up front? Please look around. No, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up because I want you to all look around. I want you to get this image of your mind. Apply that to yourself. Remember that the next time somebody asks you to take on a project and you're going, you know, I'm really stretched thin, but I guess I could do that if I quit playing the saxophone, if I stop going to the gym, if I cut back on sleep from six hours a night to five. Um, you know, saying no when somebody asks you to take something on that you don't have the time and energy for, it feels sometimes like you're disappointing them, but you're actually doing them a favor. And if you're in any doubt of that, about that, remember all those hands in the air. Remember all the organizers who are saying, as much as I want you to do this thing, I want you to say no if you can't do it. Um, and you're not just doing them a favor, you are doing the community and the movement a favor as well. You're doing the movement a favor by taking care of yourself. You're doing the movement a favor by putting fuel in the car, by putting sunlight in the fruit tree, by keeping yourself from burning out and keeping yourself in the movement for the long haul. I mean, I get it. It can be really hard to look around and see so much in the world that is terrible, so much that could be better, that needs to be better, so much that is crying out for help. I get it, totally. I completely understand the urge to fix all of it at once, immediately, and not rest until it's all better. But there's a reason that burnout rates are high in helping professions, helping professions like teaching, or healthcare, or activism. Um, and you know, those of us who are motivated by a strong sense of compassion are not always good at aiming that compassion towards ourselves. We're not always good at thinking of ourselves as one of those people who deserves compassion. You know, we're not always good at putting gas in the car and at nourishing the tree that bears the fruit. You know, and obviously, I'm not gonna try to talk you out of that compassionate impulse. I love the fact that so many atheists have that compassionate impulse and have that desire to help people and do good. What I will say is that one of the people who deserves that compassion is you. And I will say that your compassionate impulse, your desire to help make the world better, it will be much better served in the long run if you don't burn out. Once again, Self-care is not selfish. You know, again, I understand the impulse, I am right there with you, but I promise you, we are not going to be crushed into a fundamentalist theocracy if you take a vacation. <laughs> you know, if you decide to go to the gym, if you go line dancing once a week, if you decide that, you know, you'd love for your group to do a big Darwin Day event, but you just don't have it in you this year, you know, if you ask somebody else to do volunteer coordinating for your group and they don't do a perfect job right away, that is not what is going to crush us into a fundamentalist theocracy. This is a big movement. It is growing by leaps and bounds every day. Again, not Buffy the Vampire Slayer, not Frodo. The weight of the entire world is not on your shoulders. Um, and on the topic of sharing the burden, I want to shift focus now. I've been talking about how we can keep ourselves from burning out. I've been talking about self-care. And I want to talk now about how we can help each other 
to not burn out, how we can support each other in this. Um, burnout prevention is not just something we do for ourselves. It is a community effort. Um, it's something we can do for each other. And what I want to talk about now for the rest of the talk is how we can create community values and community structures that support self-care, that support sustainable activism, that support people in not burning out and in staying in atheist activism for the long haul. The number one thing I want to say about this is give praise to people who are taking care of themselves and thank them for it. If somebody says, no, I really can't do that, I'm overextended, I just don't have that in me, accept no for an answer. And in fact, don't just accept no for an answer, thank them for saying no. Literally say, I get that it was hard for you to say no, thank you for doing that. Thank them for not saying yes and then flaking out or doing a half-assed job. And thank them for taking care of themselves. Say, thank you, I am really glad that you are doing what you need to do to not burn out and to stay in the movement. And the flip side of that is also true. Don't reinforce the idea that constantly pushing yourself makes you a badass. You know, if somebody tells you I really need to get some sleep, don't tell them that sleep is for wusses. You know, if somebody says that they need to take a break from activism for a while, don't guilt trip them about it. You know, sure, let them know that they're valued and that you'll miss them, but support them in taking care of themselves. And if they seem like they're feeling guilty, if they're feeling like they're feeling really bad, it's like, I'm such a bad person, I have to go to sleep. You know, um, please remind them. Self-care is not selfish. Um, another way that we can support each other in not burning out is don't keep piling work on one person or on the same few people. Uh, we have this tendency, and this isn't just atheists, this is human, uh, we have this tendency to let the super responsible, super efficient people who are doing all the work keep doing it. I mean, hey, they've done such a great job in the past, shouldn't they just keep on doing it all the time? Um, many people may be familiar with what's called the 80-20 principle, which states that typically 20% of the people in the group do 80% of the work. Now, that may be unavoidable, that may just be human nature, don't let it become 90-10. Don't let it become 95-5. If you can push it to 70-30, that would be really great. Um, you know, really, piling work on the same people over and over again, it is a recipe for burnout. And you don't want the super responsible, super efficient people in your group burning out. Those are the people you really want to keep in the group. Um, and also, keep an eye on the gender dynamics of this. It's really common in groups and organizations for women to wind up doing the lion's share of the actual work. Please don't let this happen. And don't let the same people do the crappy scut work all the time, unless that's what they really want to do. You know, don't always have Pat be the one to fold the flyers and Chris be the one to hold the parties. Unless Pat really, really likes folding flyers and really doesn't want to host parties. Make sure that the fun jobs and the glory jobs get shared around. And once again, please keep an eye on the gender dynamics of this. It is really common in groups and organizations for women to wind up doing the lion's share of the crappy scut work uh, and for men to get to be front and center as the visible representatives getting the glory. Uh, don't let that happen. Uh, make sure that women, that people of color, that other marginalized people get support and encouragement to take on positions of leadership and visibility if they want that. Ask them to do it. There's a really important um, statistic, I guess. I don't know if it's a statistic or not. There's, there's a, a truth. There's a true thing, a fact. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, which is that it's very common for women, people of color, and other marginalized people to not, we haven't been trained to think of ourselves as leaders. We haven't tra been trained to think of ourselves as, you know, representatives. That's not how our culture kind of teaches us to not do that. But um, if we're asked to do it, then that gives us the idea that we can do it. Um, there is, this is the, the fact that I want to tell you is that um, there's an organization that works to get women to run for office and they said that the number one factor that gets women running for office is simply having somebody ask them to do it. So if you have women, other mar women, people of color, other marginalized people in your group, ask them, would you like to be in a position of leadership, in a position of visibility? 
Um, a really good way for us to avoid burnout as a community is to recognize and celebrate our achievements. You know, let's talk with each other about things we're doing well, give compliments for jobs well done. Um, you know, we have this tendency as human beings to complain. I've read somewhere, and I, this is, this, I read this, this is in the I read it somewhere times, so, you know, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like 75% of all human conversation is complaining. Um, and I, I get that, but it's kind of, that adds to burnout, you know, that grinds us down. So give compliments. And I know that when I'm feeling beaten down or discouraged, getting an email or a comment from somebody who says that they appreciate my work, it is like a shot of adrenaline. I mean, it really, it's huge. It makes such a difference. Um, and we can do this individually, and we can also do it as a group effort, as a community. Um, I've seen people do this great thing online where they set aside a day to say nice things online to people whose work they admire. Um, it's sort of as a counterbalance to how much negative shit goes online. Um, maybe we could institutionalize this. You know, we could make the first day of the month be say something nice to an atheist day. Um, you know, and this makes individuals on the receiving end feel less burnt out, and it also kind of helps us all, I think. I think it fosters a culture where we're all more conscious of the good work that we're doing, and we all feel more replenished. Um, and in groups and organizations, let's make sure that we recognize and celebrate group achievements. You know, set aside time for a post-conference celebration for the organizers and volunteers. Set aside Volunteer Appreciation Day. Be sure to say thank you to staff and volunteers on a regular basis. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever worked in a job where your boss never, ever said thank you. It's really depressing. Um, if you've worked for a, a boss who says thank you now and then, you know, thanks, you did a good job on that, it's really energizing. Um, and remember how I said earlier in the talk that looking in the, at the long game can be a way of preventing burnout? Um, that doesn't just have to be an individual activity, that can be a community activity. Groups and organizations uh, can celebrate anniversaries and landmarks. We can remind each other of how far we've come. I mean, personally, every time I see one of those charts showing the rise of godlessness, I'm sure you've all seen them, and I have seen so many atheist talks because I go to a lot of conferences. I've seen that chart, rise of atheism, rise of godlessness. Every time I see it, I am delighted. I am still not sick of it, and I've seen it dozens of times. It always makes me happy, and it always inspires me to keep doing this work. And when we keep doing these kinds of community celebrations, um, it also promotes social bonding, and that also helps prevent burnout. Um, I want to make a quick note about celebrations before I move on. Um, I think it's important that we at least sometimes celebrate in ways that don't always have to do with alcohol or, or, or other drugs. Again, not saying drugs are bad, okay, not saying don't ever drink. I like to have a drink or two or, you know, occasionally three. Um, you know, I'm not saying we should never have a drink to celebrate a job well done. But if that's what we are always doing, if we reflexively turn to getting hammered as our standard way of celebrating and blowing off steam, I think that can contribute to a reflexive tendency to use alcohol or other drugs to self-medicate for stress. And that can be a red flag for abuse. Also, a lot of people in our, in our communities are clean and sober, or just don't much like getting hammered, or don't like being around other people who are hammered. Um, going out for drinks, again, it can be a great way to celebrate, but let's mix it up. Let's find some other ways to celebrate as well. May I suggest chocolate? <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, that actually leads to another really important principle of building a culture that helps prevent burnout. It's really important to recognize that different people relieve and reduce stress in different ways. You know, you might reduce your stress by meditating or camping out in the woods. Somebody else might reduce their stress by going clubbing all night and then going to the firing range. Um, you know, I think it's fine to suggest stress reduction techniques that you think might help somebody, but we have to remember that we reduce stress differently. Don't insist that everybody do it the same way that you do. And related to that, remember that different people don't just relieve stress with different things. Different people get stressed out by different things. I mean, if you're nudging your friend to go to a big party with you because you think you're helping them take care of themselves, you know, you think that you're encouraging them to, you know, let's blow off some steam, let's get some social time, let's take care of yourself. If your friend is shy, if they're an introvert, if they just don't like parties, 
they may not experience that as encouragement to take care of themselves. They may experience that as pressure to do something that they actually find stressful. Um, introverts unite. Um, um, so, so let's support each other in reducing stress in whatever way works for us, and let's make sure to provide a variety of stress reduction community activities. You know, let's go out drinking and let's also have chocolate parties. <laughs> um, so there's another hugely important thing we can do to support each other in not burning out. Um, it's a little bit more of a sensitive topic, but it's really important. If we want to support each other in not burning out, we need to pay attention to our unconscious isms. We need to pay attention to our unconscious racism, sexism, classism, ableism, homophobia, transphobia, and so on. You know, being an atheist activist, it's stressful enough by itself. It's even more stressful when you have extra marginalizations and stigmas piled onto the ones you have because you're an atheist. It's even harder when you have to deal with that marginalization and stigma from the people you're trying to do atheist activism with. Um, <laughs> if you're not familiar with the tomb, um, term, uh, Google microaggressions. If you're not familiar with the term, this is very well-researched stuff. This is not new ground or controversial. Little ways of making people feel marginalized add up and they, and they are very stressful. Um, so educate yourself about isms and the ways that you might be perpetuating them without meaning to. Don't assume that because you're a basically decent person, therefore you don't have any work to do in this area. Don't assume that because you're not in the Ku Klux Klan that you don't have some unconscious racism that you're perpetuating. Um, listen, like really listen, like the kind of listening that involves stopping talking for two minutes and listening. Um, Listen to what marginalized people say about marginalization and how they slash we do and don't like to be treated. Uh, speak up when you see other people screwing this up. Um, if somebody else tells you that you're screwing this up, pay attention. And when you screw it up, apologize. Um, and here's the thing, if atheism is going to flourish, we need to be welcoming to more than just straight, white, middle class, college educated, able bodied, cisgendered men. And that is not a dig at straight, white, middle class, college educated, able bodied, cisgendered men. I have many of these people in my life. I adore them. I have great affection for them. It's not that they're bad, it's that they're a very small sliver of the world. And we need to be bigger than that if we're going to succeed. Uh, and understanding that there are ways that we make people feel unwelcome without meaning to, and working on getting better about that, that is a great way to help keep some awesome atheist activists from burning out. Um, and one more short note on that topic before I finish up. Don't dismiss harassment. Um, persistent harassment, especially of women, it is a real thing in this movement. Um, and that includes sexual harassment, and it includes persistent campaigns of hateful online harassment and threats. Uh, and it is driving amazing women out of this movement. It has already driven amazing women out of this movement. And it's kept women out of the movement. I can't tell you how many, many women I've talked with who are atheists, who are doing political activism in some other field, who have taken a look at atheism and said, fuck this. I don't want to go there because I've seen what happens on Reddit. Atheism, you know? Because I've seen what happens to women on Twitter who are atheists and feminists. You know, it's keeping women out of the movement and it's driving women out of the movement. Um, don't trivialize harassment, don't make excuses for it, don't talk about how the people perpetrating it are really nice people if you would get to know them. You know, they're so nice to their dog, who cares that you, they called you a cunt on Twitter. Um, don't be more skeptical about claims of harassment than you would be about claims of Bigfoot. Um, Hyperskepticism is not skepticism, it's denialism. Um, don't blame the victims of it, don't lecture victims of it about how to deal with it, and don't tell victims to ignore it. Harassment and threats are stressful enough without being gaslighted about how it's not really that bad, and if you just ignored it, it would go away. Um, harassment and threats are stressful enough without having to wonder if you're going to be supported by your community if you speak out about it. Actually, forget about wondering. Harassment and threats are stressful enough without knowing about as certainly as you can know anything that if you speak out of it about it, it's going to start a shitstorm of controversy. Um, 
If we want women in this movement to not burn out, we need to make it inescapably, unquestionably clear that that is not atheist culture and that this community does not and will not tolerate it. Um, thank you. Um, and, and finally, um, thank you. Finally, and very, very importantly, if you think somebody you know is burning out, speak up, tell them. Point them to the signs of burnout. Uh, let them know how valuable they are, how much you want them in the movement for the long haul. Offer to help if you can. If you can't, point to other people who can help. Um, and if they start going on about how, no, 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 I can't take a break, I can't take care of myself, I'm indispensable, look at all the things, uh, make them watch this video of this talk, this is gonna be going online. Um, if they're insistent they don't have 50 minutes to look at a video, there's a 20 minute version of this talk um, uh, that I gave to the Secular Student Alliance, uh, make them watch that. Um, if you have to, find a pen and paper, write these words on it, and hold it up in their face, Pin it to their shirt if you have to, one last time. Self-care is not selfish. Um, and if somebody is saying this to you, if somebody you know is telling you, I am really worried about you, that you're burning out, if somebody you know is scribbling, self-care is not selfish on a piece of paper and holding it up in your face and pinning it to your shirt, listen to them. Take it seriously and take care of yourself. Take care of your physical health and your mental health. Get a life and set aside time for that life. Do what actor, whatever activism you like to do and allow that to change. Let go of perfectionism and multitasking. Pay attention to the long game. Learn to say no and remember that you are not in this alone. Yes, there is harm being done in the world. There is so much potential for the world to be better. And yes, you can change the world. You are going to change the world. You are changing the world right now. But you're not doing it alone. And you are going to change this world so much more powerfully. You are going to help make this world so much of a better place if you stay strong, if you stay powerful, and if you stay in the movement for many, many years to come. Let's take care of ourselves and let's take care of each other. Thank you. One more time. One more time. <laughs>